Well, hello and welcome to another Faith, Philosophy and Life with me, Mr. Shelton. It's great to see you and uh, I hope that you are doing as well as you can be. And if you're watching this at home, I feel very sorry for you. But that's life and we'll move on. Now, behind me are the three omni words that I keep banging on about every day. Like I tell my daughter, she almost must close the door when she leaves the room. These are my omni words that I'm going to complete going on about with you. What do they mean? Have a think. What do those omni words mean? Okay, so omnipotent means all-knowing. All no, it doesn't. It means all-powerful. Omniscient, all-knowing, comes from the word science. And omnibenevolent, yep, that's all-loving because you've got the word love in the middle of it, just backwards. So, uh, today we are going to think about where Christians think evil and suffering come from. Last time we looked at the origins of evil and suffering from some people's perspectives. We're going to specifically look at some Christian viewpoints today. So go and grab your pen and paper because here's our cheesy intro music. Okay, as usual, you need to pause this clip as we go. So our title is, Where do Christians think suffering comes from? Uh, today we're going to explore again in a little bit more detail, a little bit differently about what Christians think about suffering. It's going to be a good outcome if you could say why suffering is a problem for Christians, same as last time. Great if we can give at least two Christian responses to suffering, and even better if you can apply that to some real life situations. So, uh, during today's session, we've going to again we've just thought about what god is like because i'm going on about that every time there's a media clip we'll have another knowledge trawl again and then we'll reflect on our understanding of god again so to start off with um i'm going to play a clip to you i'd like you to watch this this is taken from a channel 4 documentary called evil by uh, a bishop called tom wright who was a, a church of england uh, theologian bishop thing was bishop of durham at the time uh, either way uh, it's well worth watching so pin back your ears let's watch this and uh, make a few notes while it's on about what he thinks about evil as well our world is in a tragic and bloody mess and it isn't just bad luck there's a force which drives people you me politicians and even whole nations in the wrong direction our world has tried to ignore it, but recent events have shown us we can't. We must take it seriously, and we must give it its true name. Evil. We can't look honestly at the world without recognizing that evil exists. Real, serious evil is going on all the time. But it doesn't have to be this way. There is a solution. And it offers us a startling but effective way of dealing with evil in the real world. Unbelievable? Well, you may be surprised. So what exactly is evil? And what do people like me mean when we talk about Jesus' death as some kind of victory over evil? It's my belief that in today's world we've been going about things in entirely the wrong way. We tried to pretend that evil didn't exist or that if it did it was just a little problem and we could deal with it quite easily. People often assume that the Bible's answer to the problem of evil is Adam and Eve eating an apple in a garden. But that's a way of stating the problem, not of answering it. Again, people often suppose that the Bible blames it all on the devil or the Satan. And it's true that the force of evil is often spoken of in very personal terms. 
But once again, that's a way not of answering the problem, just of restating it. When the Bible talks about demons and devils, it's not trying to explain evil, but trying to characterize the dark forces that can take control of all of us. The dark side which emerges when individuals use their free will to make bad choices in their lives. The side we see in the tragic story the Bible tells from the Garden of Eden onwards. So the Bible doesn't offer us a theory about evil, it tells the story of how evil works and the story of what God is doing about it. And the reason a story is the best way of getting at the problem of evil is because the force of evil works as a process. According to popular opinion at least, child molesters are the most evil people to be found today and their crimes show all the signs of the process of evil at work. Yet they, like all of us, possess the gift of free will. They make choices too. Since the fall of Jerusalem, Israelites in exile had hoped for a Messiah who would disentangle and roll back the web of evil. But one exiled prophet transformed the image of the Messiah. The text is found here, in the oldest known copy of a whole biblical book, the book of Isaiah. We sometimes refer to this passage as the suffering servant. And this is it. This is the point of the scroll, where Isaiah launches a whole new chapter in the biblical story of God and evil. You see, Israel had been exiled for gross misconduct, much like Adam and Eve from the garden, and actually that's probably part of the point. But God is faithful, and he will do what he's promised. He will redeem Israel, humanity, and creation itself. And he will do so because of the work of the servant, whose suffering and death are the means by which all the evil in the world will be dealt with. And that's how God is going to make a new future out the other side of evil, a new future for creation itself. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah's servant is one of the last great signposts that leads us to the climax of the biblical story, the final stage in God's dealing with evil. And this gives us a glimpse of what we can do to make that real today. Every year at Easter, Christians celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. The whole point of Christianity is the claim that through these actual events, the evil in our world is defeated. Through these amazing events themselves, yes, but also through the way they can work out in our own time. But why do we believe all this? To understand that, we have to go back to the sources, to the Gospels themselves. Today, people often think of the story of Jesus and his death and resurrection as just a string of random events with some Christian meaning stuck on the outside like a label. But the way the Gospel writers tell the story, the meaning of the final events is contained within the whole narrative itself. And that entire story is in turn rooted in and sums up the story of the people of Israel. That is, the story of a people with whom God made a deal that he was going to put the world to rights. As Jesus grew up, there was social and political turmoil. The Jews were living under Roman occupation. Many people were longing for God to rescue them by sending the true King, the Messiah. But what 
would such a rescue operation look like? A military revolt? A sudden display of irresistible supernatural power? A leader establishing his own power and prestige? Those were the questions Jesus faced when he, like ancient Israel, went off into the desert and faced the powers of evil. After 40 days in desert seclusion, the pressure was intense and the temptations Jesus experienced in the desert were temptations to be the Messiah people expected, to grab economic, religious and lastly political power. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. With the crucifixion, we come close to the heart of the question of how God deals with evil. Christians claim that Jesus took on the whole burden of evil and exhausted it on the cross. But the story also shows how we can put that into practice. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Jesus had acted out the calling which he himself had announced and which had been foretold by Isaiah. He had been the suffering servant. He had turned the other cheek. He had picked up the Roman cross and gone the second mile. And most important, he forgave his tormentors. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For Christians, it's the crucifixion of Jesus, not his subsequent resurrection which defeated evil. You see, the resurrection wasn't the real victory. It was the sign that the victory had already been accomplished on the cross. Once Jesus had taken the full force of evil onto himself and had exhausted it, death itself had no more power over him. And that's why the new world that God had planned and promised really did come into being at Easter. And that leaves us with a task to put into practice what he had accomplished. And whether or not we can get our heads around all that theory, the gospel stories give us plenty of concrete pointers as to how to deal with evil in the here and now. Remember how the Bible tells its story of evil. Evil is real and powerful. It's a process, a force with enough energy to overwhelm us all, you, me, our communities and even whole nations. Evil isn't just in other places or people, it's in all of us. And in the Gospels, God deals with it by becoming a man, becoming Jesus, letting it do its worst to him and breaking its power. The result is one of the most powerful things in the whole world, forgiveness. It's tough and it's messy to go this route, but it can be done. And then the thick tide of evil begins to roll back. The lessons of the crucifixion, of how liberating honesty and forgiveness can be, are valid everywhere. But it seems we prefer not to learn them. So Jesus' death poses an urgent question to all of us. Evil is real and it matters. Will we let that death transform not just our lives, but our whole way of life. Okay, so, um, back to the same big question that we had last time. After, what, after, the, after discussing what Christians believe about God, why is suffering a problem? And does what Tom Wright says actually support some of those ideas? Is suffering evil is that just because that's what humanity makes it 
or is there a darker force out there called the devil? So this is what um, we are going to do. Uh, you are in the description below. There is a worksheet I would like you to access, please, for this one. And this has got sort of the main six ideas uh, that Christians have as to where evil and suffering comes from. Last time we looked at really origins of evil and suffering. This time we're thinking about where a, a biblical response to that in the main. Um, so you need to give yourself four minutes for each thing. Okay, I'm not going to time it on, on screen. You can just pause it as you go. Uh, but you'll see I've already listed out the key ideas on the right hand on the left hand side of that worksheet. And what you are going to do is you need to add a little bit more information. Then you're going to be saying what's good and what's bad about this in your own opinion. So access that description below and then come back to me. So pause me now when you've got that. OK, so hopefully now you've got that so we can proceed. So I'm not going to read these through for you. Uh, they'll be on the screen. You can read them yourselves and then complete that line of the grid and then come back to me. Give yourself three or four minutes to do that. Here's the next one. And the next one. The next one. The next one. And finally. So um, we've now come up with a whole list of other ideas about where some Christians think evil comes from. And most of those are biblical, other than with the exception of soul making, which brings us on to sort of our almost final task, to be honest with you. It's very similar to your last one that you did last week. But this time you've got some more options to choose from. So here's a little structure for you as well on this one. Give two reasons that Christians give to explain why there's evil and suffering in the world. So you're going to link back to last lesson. You're also going to look at today's. And uh, particularly look at what the Bible teaches this time. So if you look back to that worksheet you've completed, hopefully you've got loads of biblical examples there. So it's two paragraphs, give yourself eight minutes, give it a go, photograph everything, send it through to your teachers. Um, but pause me and then come back to me in a minute once you've got that done. So give yourself eight minutes and I'll see you in a few. So we said it would be good if we could say why suffering is a problem for Christians. I think we're kind of exhausting this now. Uh, great if you can give at least two and hopefully I'm sure you can give me four or five from today's lesson plus last week's. And even better if you can apply those to real life situations. So um, we had this plenary last time and that was quite deliberate because I want you to build on that. So now you've had those reflections. What else would you do that you wouldn't have written down last time? You know, God's power for the day. How would you help other people? And would you? Would that be the best thing to do or not? So I'm going to leave it there. Thanks for your time. Take care of yourself. Stay safe. Wash hands. God bless you. And I'll be seeing you soon.